Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. Silas Marner. By George Eliot. Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelo, George Eliot's third novel, was first published in 1861. It tells the narrative of a weaver and the transformation of his life. After being wrongfully accused of theft from his chapel, Silas has been forced to flee his former home. He moves to Ravelo and takes up weaving as a career. Because he works 16 hours a day, the only thing that brings him joy is the gold that he has earned. Most of the people have fled because of his gloomy and reclusive demeanor. Ravelo is home to two brothers. Because their father is the local squire, they have plenty of money. However, Dunstan, the eldest, is a womanizer, a drunkard, and a gambler. Godfrey, despite being the oldest, has a low-born opium addict as a hidden wife. At some point in time, Dunstan takes Silas Gold and flees, never to be found. In the midst of all of Godfrey's friend's grief over the death of Molly, Godfrey's estranged wife is trudging through the snow to face him in front of their daughter. The woman pulls over to take a hit of opium, lies down, and the one-year-old goes off in search of her mother. She makes her way into Silas's residence and opens the door for him. He looks after the child and adopts her after discovering her mother's body. Named Hepzibah, Epi, Silas cares for and adores her to the fullest. Epi has matured into a stunning young lady in the intervening 16 years. She intends to marry a local man and bring Silas with them when they do so. When Dunstan's body is found in a stone pit behind Silas' house, clutching the gold bags, they learn he fell in while fleeing with the gold. In the light of this, Godfrey admits to being Epi's father. Since he and his wife, Nancy, a woman of impeccable moral character and social standing, never had children of their own, he would want to adopt Epi and nurture her as a gentleman's daughter. Defiant, she refuses, intending to marry and carry on with her plans for the future. Silas is the father she says, but Godfrey and his wife continue to lend a hand whenever they are able, even though they know the truth. She marries Aaron, a country boy, and Silas receives a son instead of a daughter. They all have a wonderful life together. Silas Marner lives in the fictional English village of Ravelo. In the early 1800s, he is a weaver. Because they spend their time indoors, weavers are shunned by the farming community, which prefers to work outside in the sun. These people are nearly unnerving to others because they spend all their time indoors and appear to be strange individuals. They develop their own unique personality traits. Village lads enjoy peering through the window of Marner's house. His swift and nimble hands enchant the people who watch him weave and murmur about his understanding of plants. The boys flee in terror when Silas directs his gaze at them. Silas has been a recluse in Ravelo for the past 15 years. To my knowledge, he hasn't had any buddies drop by or courted any of the local female residents. Silas resided in Lantern Yard before that. He had a good life in Lantern Yard, he was active in his neighborhood, a well-liked churchgoer, and he even had a fiancé. Silas, on the other hand, was filling in for his church's senior deacon when he witnessed a dramatic shift in his life. A replacement was arranged but never showed up, Silas's best friend William. Silas awoke to find the deacon's respiration had ceased just as it was getting light. Silas wondered if he had somehow fallen asleep when he discovered that the deacon's church money was vanished. The money had been replaced by Silas' pocket knife, which the church members discovered. The bag containing the money was found in Silas's house. Silas was convicted of the murder thanks to the support of his best buddy, William. To decide his culpability, the church drew lots. Silas was excommunicated after the results of the lottery proved him guilty. When Sarah found out what had happened, she broke off their engagement. In the presence of William, Silas remembered seeing the knife for the last time, but no one believed he was right. When William married Sarah, Silas left town and moved to Ravelo. Silas discarded Christianity. In contrast to Lantern Yard, Ravelo has a more secular atmosphere. When Silas is done weaving, he has no idea what to do with the money he earned. He hoards money because he doesn't have a boss or a church to whom he can give some of it away. His mother experienced the same symptoms as his neighbor, and he begins to wonder if it could be the same thing. Silas buys some herbs for the woman because he remembered the doctor's advice. Because the remedy is so effective, other individuals seek treatment from him. When Silas says he doesn't know how to help them, they think he's faking it to get their attention. Then people begin to point the finger at him when things go wrong in their lives. This just serves to further isolate Silas from his former friends. Working 16-hour days, Silas keeps his money in a pot under the loom and under the floor of the room where it is kept. He enjoys playing with the gold at night. Affectionately caressing it like it were his only companion. 
When Silas Riches outgrows the pot, he divides it between two leather bags. The next 15 years pass without incident, until a disastrous Christmas. The tale shifts to a new cast of characters in Chapter 3. Squire Cass is one of the wealthiest men in Ravelo. It is a shame that he has two sons, both of whom failed to impress. He is a gambler, a drinker, and a womanizer, known as Dunstan or Dunsey by his friends and family. Godfrey, the eldest, is a sweet kid with a dark side. Molly Farron, his hidden wife, is an opium addict and a heavy drinker. Godfrey is in love with Nancy Lameter, a woman everyone wants him to marry, and he can't let his marriage be known. A squabble has broken out between Dunsey and Godfrey because Dunsey gambled away the rent money he and Godfrey had gathered. Godfrey wants the money, but Dunsey doesn't have it to give it to him. By reminding him of his secret marriage, Godfrey is reminded of what Dunsey has threatened to inform their father about. For the sake of repaying Dunsey's debt, Godfrey is instructed to sell his horse. He threatens to tell his father and face the consequences, but Dunsey calms him down and offers to take Godfrey's horse to market. According to the narrator, it was Dunsey who persuaded Godfrey to marry the woman so that he could use it as blackmail. Because he loves Nancy and believes she is what his life requires, he will grow old like a country squire, drinking and moping around in misery. Next day, Dunsey takes Godfrey's horse to be sold by Dunsey. He thinks about Silas's gold as he passes his house on his way to work. In the end, he decides to sell his horse rather than just take the money because it causes his brother so much anguish. He secures a deal with a customer who will pay in full upon receipt of the merchandise. But first, Dunsey and his friends decide to go horseback riding. The horse was killed while attempting to jump a fence because the rider was racing it too fast. Without a way to collect the money he needs, Dunsey walks away unscathed. On the way home, Dunsey spots Silas's house and tries to avoid it. He decides to introduce himself because there is a light on. When Dunsey enters the house and discovers that Silas isn't there, he takes a seat in front of the fire. It wasn't long before he started to wonder about Silas Gold, and noticed a spot on the floor that appeared to have been purposefully restored. The gold bags are found once he puts the bricks aside. They are then taken away by him in the middle of the night. A homecoming for Silas is imminent. He is looking forward to a delicious roast dinner and has no concerns. Because he has never been robbed, it doesn't bother him to leave his door unlocked while he runs errands. After failing to locate his gold, he does not immediately turn to robbery. He believes he is being punished once more by a higher authority. After a while, though, his practical side takes over, and he sets out to determine which of his neighbors was responsible for the break-in. To report the crime, he heads to Squire Cass. At the Rainbow, a small tavern, Silas assumes he will find the squire, but instead he discovers a party attended by everyone from the upper echelons of society. At the bar, he only encounters people from lower social classes. The topics range from a parson who mismanaged a wedding to a supposedly haunted stable in the area. Silas is distraught and exhausted when he arrives. Jem Rodney is summoned by the pub's owner for assistance. A well-known poacher is a person of interest to Silas, who immediately begins to accuse the man of taking his money upon hearing his name. If the man returns his money, Silas claims he won't press charges. It turns out that Rodney was in the pub all night, and Silas apologizes to him for suspecting him of being there. He volunteers to go back and hunt for evidence at Silas's house after hearing the narrative of the crime in full and learning that 270 pounds were stolen. Finally, Silas is taken to the constable by Mr. Dowless and the proprietor of the pub. The robbery has caused quite a stir around town. Everyone is wondering who the thief is. There was a tinder box at the crime scene, which several witnesses claim to have seen a wandering peddler holding recently. Silas likes this notion because he wants to find a someone to blame for what happened. As Godfrey begins to wonder about the whereabouts of his brother, the situation becomes more dire. It turns out the horse that was meant to be sold by him has already been sold. He contemplates disclosing everything to his father on the way home. However, he is apprehensive about the man's temperament. After much soul-searching, he chooses to divulge only half of the narrative and place the blame on Dunsey. Predictably, Godfrey and his brother are accused by their father of spending all of their father's money. Afterwards, he asks Godfrey once more when he intends to pop the question to Nancy and offers to help him out. This is not the first time Godfrey has shifted the focus of a conversation with half-truths. Silas is in a state of depression at the moment. He sits there weaving aimlessly, occasionally interrupted by passing townspeople who bring him food or express their sympathies. 
However, no one has connected Dunsey's disappearance with the disappearance of the money. Dolly Winthrop and her son Aaron are guests of Silas. For the impending Christmas, she offers him her famous lard cake and asks him to attend church. While he claims to have simply gone to the chapel when she inquires about his religious background, the two of them are unable to explain this discrepancy. He emerges out of his sadness long enough to give some cake to the boy, who is too afraid to accept it. People in town celebrate Christmas even if Silas doesn't. Then the upper echelons attend the traditional Christmas dinner at the squire's residence that evening. At this celebration, Godfrey is looking forward to seeing Nancy, but the thought of his brother returning makes him nervous. Nancy and her father are among the first guests to arrive at the party. Nancy is torn about whether or not she wants to wed Godfrey. The fact that he bothers her doesn't mean she doesn't desire his attention. Despite her disdain for his wealth, she fantasizes about being the mistress of the Red House, where he lives. It is assumed that they are sweethearting when he goes into the parlor with her after the dance, as everyone regards the two as a match. However, she has a damaged dress and wants to wait for her sister, who arrived late to the party, to help her fix it before she leaves the room. Molly, Godfrey's wife, is on her way to the family home at the same time. In retaliation for his refusal to acknowledge her or assist in the upbringing of their daughter, she plans to take revenge on him. When the weather gets cold, Molly decides to take some opium to help her deal with it. She takes a nap while her little girl goes off in search of her mother. She spots a light in the distance. Silas's house is the source of the light. As if he thinks his money will return to him, he has started leaving his door open. While waiting for the door to open, he had an episode. He suffers from cataleptic seizures, which cause him to lose consciousness for a brief period of time and look off into the distance. He has no idea that as he stands there with the door open, a small child has wandered in. Silas' eyesight has deteriorated after years of close labor with the loom. A piece of gold and metal on his floor first seems to him as his own gold. However, upon closer inspection, a young girl is revealed. He spends the remainder of the night thinking about his deceased younger sister because she reminds him of her. The small girl wakes up weeping for her mommy in the wee hours of the morning. He gives her some brown sugar sweetened oatmeal, which he always refuses to eat. Inquiring as to where she came from after seeing wet boots, he follows her path and discovers the body of her mother. Silas enters the party with the small girl while it is still going on. Godfrey is alarmed when he sees Molly since he knows who she is. She requires medical attention, says Silas. Godfrey has to endure some harrowing minutes before he realizes Molly is no longer alive. Silas is determined to keep the girl, so he resolves to keep his paternity a secret. His gold has been replaced, in Silas' eyes, by this young lady. They're a good match because neither of them has anyone else. In the meanwhile, Godfrey is free to pursue Nancy, and he intends to do his best. Dolly Winthrop lends a helping hand to Silas in caring for the little daughter. She instructs him, but Silas prefers to do it all himself so that the girl can become attracted to him from the beginning. After she explains what baptism implies, Silas agrees to have the infant baptized. Hepzibah, after his mother and sister, is the name he chooses for her. Epi is a nickname for this girl. Both Silas and Epi have been baptized. It is enabling Silas to come out of his shell to care for such an energetic and interested child. The other villagers have noticed his increased socialization, and he even takes time off work to play with her. Despite the fact that he lavishes her with attention and never has to correct her behavior, she is a content child. Everyone adores her, and as a result, Silas receives lots of affection and attention. Even the younger members of the family are no longer afraid of him. He always takes her with him. Small presents are given from time to time but Godfrey is relieved of any guilt he may have had for not claiming his daughter by believing she is well cared for. As a result, he's free to pursue Nancy. His character has also improved. It is 16 years after the events of the first chapter. A short while ago, Silas was seen leaving the chapel with Epi, a 17-year-old girl. She's blossomed into a wonderful young lady who is very attached to her adoptive father and devoted to him. In the midst of this, Aaron Winthrop, who has recently expressed interest in Epi's marriage, is following them. Even though it would break Silas' heart, he understands that he is getting older and that she will need someone to look after her after he is gone. Silas' modest house has grown into a gorgeous home, but she and Aaron still want him to move in with them. Godfrey and Nancy have been married for a long time, but they don't have any kids. Even though she does admit that Epi turned out okay, she's always resisted the thought of adopting because she's unclear how the child of someone else will turn out. 
Godfrey has been lending a helpful hand to Silas and Epi for many years. Because of how much she loves him, Epi doesn't care that Silas isn't her biological father. Because she has no interest in her biological father, she is more interested in her mother. Silas gives her the woman's wedding ring and tells her what he remembers. Dunsey's body was found after they drained the stone pit behind Silas's house to provide water for nearby farms. Moreover, they come across Silas's cash and learn that he has been stealing it. Godfrey makes the decision to tell his wife the truth now that he has discovered this information. To her surprise, she is astonished rather than upset, and wishes he had told her sooner because she would have liked to adopt his daughter. A knock at the door interrupts Silas and Epi's conversation about the impending nuptials. Godfrey and Nancy Cass have arrived. He's here to make amends for his brother's actions and to make an adoption proposal for Epi. She declines, stating that she is content with Silas' presence in her life. The only parent she wants is Silas, so when Godfrey claims to be her father, she refuses to go with him to be a lady. It becomes clear to Godfrey that his punishment is for his daughter to reject him, and he vows to put more effort into his marriage because he is grateful that Nancy has accepted his proposal. His financial support for Epi's needs will be unwavering. When Silas and Epi return to Lantern Yard, they find that everything has changed and that everyone he remembers is gone. The fact that he will never know what happened since he is innocent calms him. Epi and Aaron get married at the end of the story. Godfrey has gone away for special reasons, but Nancy is there. As the house is so warm, Aaron and Epi decide to stay with Silas. They've made a few changes, including a beautiful garden that Godfrey gave them as a gift. At the end, Epi says, I think nobody could be happier than we are. Characters. Silas Marner, a simple weaver. Because he was wrongly convicted of stealing in his community, he ended up losing his fiancée Sarah and his best buddy William. They are married after he leaves, which is strange. Silas has lost faith in both God and humankind. For 16 hours each day, he weaves in Ravelo, where he lives. The sole weaver in town, his business is brisk, in spite of his sour disposition. The gold he has earned and amassed appears to be his sole ally. Silas undergoes a radical transformation after a young girl is substituted for his stolen fortune. His character undergoes radical transformations as he grows more outgoing. Because of this, he can raise his daughter with a firm belief in God. He becomes a valued part of the community thanks to the aid he receives from the villagers. A man's adoptive daughter's affection is more important to him than any money in the world when his gold returns to him. Godfrey Cass, the eldest son of the squire of the village, Ravelo. He's friendly and generally a good guy, but he's also a wimp. It's his brother who convinces him to marry an opium addict, and then it's his brother who keeps the marriage hidden from him. And then there's the fact that he can't marry a local girl who's in love with him since she's in his class. Despite the fact that Godfrey now has the opportunity to remarry his estranged wife and become a father, he chooses to keep his daughter Silas' upbringing a secret from the world. Dunstan Cass, the youngest son of the squire. As a gambler, he's also a heavy drinker. He is a manipulator and a thief. His gold was stolen by the robber who ended up dead in a ditch. Epi, Silas's adopted daughter. First, she's just another piece of gold, but he soon learns that she's so much more than just that. She's vivacious and cheers him up every day. In spite of the fact that her biological father isn't interested in her, she's content with the things he offers her as she grows up. When Epi marries a country boy at the end of the novel, she begs Silas to move in with her and her new husband. Nancy Lameter Cass, a pretty girl with a good social class and high moral standards. She finally accepts to marry Epi's biological father, Godfrey Cass, after much back and forth. She adheres to a system of rules, which appear to be arbitrary at times. It's hard for her to comprehend why Epi decides to stay with Silas instead of becoming a gentleman's daughter, despite the fact that she claims to be unimpressed by Godfrey's wealth and status. Dolly Winthrop, a good, moral woman, she is a great help to Silas as he is raising Epi. Eventually, she will be her son's godmother and then her son's mother-in-law. He returns to the church and gets more involved in the community as a result of Dolly's support. He makes friends and gains the admiration of his peers. George Eliot was born as Marianne Evans on November 22, 1819, in Warwickshire, England. Robert Evans, her father, was the estate manager at Arbury Hall, and Christiana Evans, her mother, was the daughter of a mill owner in the area. She was the youngest of three siblings, and she also had a half-brother and a half-sister. The best schooling was given to Marianne due to her reputation of being both too brilliant and unattractive to get a husband. She was well-versed in all the classics, especially Greek, 
which had a profound effect on her writing style and tone. Marianne grew up in a pious household, but she questioned her parents' views later in life, which enraged her father. After her mother died when she was 16, Marianne dropped out of school to help her father out around the house. She also started writing, and by the time he died at the age of 30, she was a published magazine author. Charles and Cara Bray, who ran writers clubs that included Ralph Waldo Emerson, welcomed her into their circle of acquaintances. Marianne traveled to Geneva for a few days after her father's death. She met George Henry Lewis in 1851. In 1854, despite the fact that he was legally married, he began living with her. She wanted to be recognized seriously as an author, so she started writing under the pseudonym George Eliot. Assumedly, the inspiration for her pen name was her long-term partner. Eliot, George's initials, served as a pseudonym for to L, George's first name. Many women were writing at the time, but the most of them were penning romance novels, which was not what she desired to do. Eliot gained a devoted following after the publication of her debut novels. Having been rejected by society for her relationship with a married man, Marianne was ultimately embraced by the Queen when she came out as a writer. The Queen never missed one of her books after that. In fact, Eliot was even introduced to the Queen's daughter, Princess Louise. George Lewis died in 1878, and Marianne married John Cross two years later. Her younger husband, John, was a source of social embarrassment, even after her brother decided to forgive her and let her back into the family through a legally recognized marriage. While they were on their honeymoon in Venice, he attempted to take his own life by leaping from a balcony into the Grand Canal. They made Chelsea their home and started a family there. She married him in May of 1880, but she died in December of that year from a chronic kidney infection and a throat infection. She was 61 when she passed away. Her lapsed beliefs in Christianity and her friendship with George Lewis made it impossible for her to be buried in Westminster Abbey. Consequently, she was laid to rest in Highgate Cemetery alongside George Lewis' gravestone. Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner was dedicated to her in 1980, 100 years after her death. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video. Music